Zechariah chapter 7 has us entering the third section of this mighty prophetic book. Section 1 was the introduction. Section 2 was the eight waking visions in one night. Section 3 are the four answers from God to the people as articulated in chapters 7 and 8. Section 4 is the final two burdens or oracles of Zechariah. Let's get to today's passage, Zechariah 7, starting at verse 1. God speaks to his people through Zechariah by giving two answers to the Jews. Verse 1. Now in the fourth year of King Darius, it came to pass that the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month, Kislev. God gives the exact date of this prophecy. It occurred in the year 518 BC, the fourth of Kislev. This ain't no fairy tale. It's been two years since the end of the last verse, the night of his eight waking visions. The house of God, the temple, has still not been completed. Zechariah was a true prophet of God. I know I labour this point often, but it sickens me to hear cream puff, fairy floss, false prophets in churches today claiming to hear directly from God. God told me this. God spoke to me and told me to tell you. God gave me this message today to bring to you. I simply don't believe you. I think it's far more likely you're a fake wannabe prophet if you're saying these types of things. If you claim God speaks directly to you on a private phone line that no one else hears, I'd say it's 99.99% likely you're a fraud. There are as many of these fake prophets in conservative churches as there are in charismatic churches. The word of God is now complete. God said all he needs for us to know in the 66 books of the word of God. In the next dispensation, during the tribulation, there'll be a dramatic return of the prophets of God after the rapture of the church. Now, I'm no cessationist. But I'm a sceptic. You say, God told you? I say, I'm going to watch and listen to every prediction you make. You get one thing wrong, and I'll happily and publicly condemn you as a false prophet. Verse 2. When the people sent Sherazar with Regem, Melech and his men to the house of God to pray before the Lord, and to ask the priests who were in the house of the Lord of hosts and the prophets, saying, Should I weep in the fifth month and fast as I've done for so many years? It's November or December 518 BC. The house of God is being rebuilt. And at this point, a delegation of Jews from outside of Jerusalem send a question to the Levites and prophets at the temple that's being rebuilt. Many texts and most modern translations say these men were from Bethel, 10 miles north of Jerusalem. Others say this message came from much further abroad. Their Babylonian names lend some weight to this claim. Numerous scholars even suggesting the message may have come from a Jewish delegation close to Darius. Whether the original source of the message was from Bethel or further afield? The question at first glance seems reasonable. Should they continue to fast and mourn for the destroyed temple, considering it was now being rebuilt? God never wrote in the law that they should observe these days of fasting. The Jews had named four days for fasting. The only time fasting was prescribed in the law was on the Day of Atonement. But the Jews of the day had decided fasting and mourning was an appropriate response to the great catastrophe. The reasonableness of their question is called into question by Yahweh's response. It seems their question was a matter of religious posturing. The delegation was trying to impress rather than gain instruction. Verse 4, Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, 
This is the first of four times this expression is used in chapters 7 and 8. God tells this prophet exactly the words he should respond with to the delegation. Don't you dare speak for God unless you're quoting or referring to Scripture as your authority in the proper context. Verse 5. Say to all the people of the land and to the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months during those 70 years, did you really fast for me? For me? When you eat and when you drink, do you not eat and drink for yourselves? This distant question comes to the house of the Lord. God ensures the question is laid at the feet of Zechariah. It could have gone to Joshua the high priest. It could have been redirected to Zerubbabel's home. It could have come to Haggai, a contemporary prophet of God. But God ensures the question is put to Zechariah. His man at this time to be the mouthpiece of God on this subject. Zechariah was both a prophet and a priest of God. Perhaps the delegation with the question arrived when Zechariah was on duty and in charge at the temple. Zechariah doesn't consult with his wise and godly earthly colleagues. He consults directly with God. And God lays bare the religious fraudsters that they were. They are as fake as a $44 bill. They fasted to look good to seem religious, to come across as pious. But they were self-serving hypocrites. Verse 7. Should you not have obeyed the words which the Lord proclaimed through the former prophets when Jerusalem and the cities around it were inhabited and prosperous and the south and the lowlands were inhabited? I didn't tell you a lot to fast. I didn't say you to do that for the temple's destruction. And now you very publicly ask about ceasing your silly fast merely so you can be seen by men. You lot are no better than your fathers. If they'd listened to God rather than playing at religion, the catastrophe would never have occurred. And you would have never needed to invent your pious fasts. Chosen people of God, descendants of Israel, Listen to the words of God, obey the true prophets of God, and the judgments of God would never have befallen you. All believers in Christ today, all the chosen of God from amongst the Jew and Gentile, we who are born again need to learn the lesson of the failure of Israel and Judah. We must study God's word, ensure it's imprinted on our hearts and ensure we live by the light of the word. Heeding the words of the former prophets, obeying the instructions and commands of the apostles and of Christ, lest we also face the judgment of God in this life or the next. Verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Execute true justice, show mercy and compassion, everyone to his brother. God gives some very practical instructions to his chosen people with this second response to Judah. And we should personally run this ruler and measuring stick over our own lives. Are we just? Do we show mercy and compassion to our brethren around us? Or are we judgmental, unfair in our dealings, lacking compassion, living mostly for our own selfish needs. Christian brothers and sisters, when was the last time you did something genuinely self-sacrificially to help your family in the Lord? I'm not talking about offering a drink of water or going to church or praying for someone. I'm talking about making real personal sacrifices to make a real positive difference in the lives of your family in Christ. God wants, God demands that his children be loving and kind and merciful and compassionate, that we go well out of our way to help our brother or sister in need. We don't earn our salvation by our works, certainly not. But our work should demonstrate if we're truly saved. If you do some honest self-examination, can you see a need to get much busier 
shining the light of Christ in your daily works. Verse 10, do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. Let none of you plan evil in his heart against his brother. God, with these words, is telling his people they must do better. We must do better. God expects more from his people. These words are from the heart of God. And when I hear the heart of God, I realise I myself must do better. I must be more Christ-like every day. I must live less for myself and more for others around me. I need to find ways to serve my brothers and sisters in Christ because that's what pleases my Lord and my God. Jesus gave up everything for me and he's blessed me super abundantly. And so much of my life is about living for me, looking after myself, making sure I'm comfortable and content when so many of my brothers and sisters and the Lord are suffering and in pain and confronting injustice, inequality and evil. Lord, give me, Lord, give us, your children, the strength, the drive, the ambition, the motivation to do better, to serve you, to get your gospel out to the lost and dying world and to find ways to practically serve our family in Christ. Verse 11, but they refused to heed shrugged their shoulders and stopped their ears so that they could not hear. Yes, they made their hearts like flint, refusing to hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. Thus great wrath came from the Lord of hosts. Lord, give everyone listening to this broadcast soft hearts to hear from you. Give me a soft heart to hear from you. Lord, examine us thoroughly. If you find any ungodly hardness or blockages, soften our hearts, unblock our ears. Revitalize our lives with your refreshing, life-transforming word. I ask, Lord, that each person listening be filled with your Holy Spirit that we may joyfully complete the works of righteousness you've laid out before us to fulfill. Lord, we would heed your voice. Lord, we never want to shrug our shoulders at your commands. We want your strength to bow humbly and obediently before your every command. But we acknowledge our sinfulness. We acknowledge our failures and how often, like Judah and Israel, we failed to follow your commands. Lord, we're thankful that you are long-suffering and slow to wrath. Our spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. God, give us your strength. Verse 13, Therefore it happened that just as he proclaimed, and they would not hear, so they called out, and I would not listen, says the Lord of hosts. Some preachers falsely teach that God always answers our prayers. Verses like this one demonstrate that is not correct. Israel and Judah for centuries lived in constant disobedience to God and ultimately God stopped listening to their prayers. Now obviously God heard the content of their prayers, but the description, I would not listen, tells us he refused to respond. Make sure your relationship with God is in good standing. Don't only come to God when you need some prayer answered. God isn't your genie in a bottle offering three wishes. Pray to God without ceasing. Thank him when something good happens. Thank him simply because you want to thank him. When some trouble arrives, lay it out before him. When you get through that trouble, thank him for his deliverance from that trouble. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. Verse 14. But I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations, which they had not known. 
Thus the land became desolate after them, so that no one passed through or returned, for they made the pleasant land desolate. How sad the land of milk and honey, 1,000 years later a desolate place, due to the hard-hearted disobedience of Israel and Judah. This endless state of the chosen people of God really brings into focus the absurdity of their question on fasting. Sometimes we can get so focused on doctrine or theology or rightly dividing the word of truth that we miss some very practical need standing right before us involving basic kindness, love, charity. God is not impressed with religion. Jesus saved his most savage responses to the most religious of the Jews. I love the old Keith Green song, To obey is better than sacrifice. Straight from the writings of Samuel. Lord, I pray that each of us have a strong and sound foundation in your word that our doctrine is firmly centred in the scriptures. But Lord, I ask that you give me an obedient heart. Lord, give any person still listening to this recording an obedient heart to serve you faithfully and diligently, such that one day they'll hear the beautiful words, well done, good and faithful servants. May God richly bless you in your daily walk with the Lord this week and beyond.